Hey guys, um, let's go ahead and read uh, chapter six of Mice and Men together. There will be a couple questions at the end of this video. So um, the good news is though, I'm not gonna give you a test, okay? So there's supposed to be a test on of mice and men, um, but I just don't see a good way to do that at the moment. Um, and so until I, you know, have a little more time to think through how I'm gonna do tests and such, um, we're just not gonna have one. So lucky you guys, um, we're, we'll, uh, I, like I said, you will have a question or two to answer at the end. And I will be kind of treating them like test questions, if that makes sense. And I'll want you to actually answer them um, and I'll be grading you for correctness. So there you go. I guess that's your test, but it's it should be pretty simple, pretty easy. So um, if you have your books, you can get it out, or um, I'm going to go ahead and project the um, uh, a PDF of the of the pages that we're going to be reading. So chapter six isn't that long. Let's go ahead and get started. Okay, where we left off in chapter five, um, Lenny unfortunately had killed um, killed Curly's wife. Um, and so then he, we can assume, probably went off to the place that they that we started the book with, kind of at the, the beginning next to the, the creek or the little river, um, where George said, hey, if you ever get into trouble, you know where to go. So it's interesting that George, I think, knows exactly where Lenny is. Um, but at the end of chapter five, um, he was kind of playing dumb and playing innocent there um, and, and not really telling anybody um, what, what was going on. Uh, when Curly discovers the, his, the body of his wife, um, he is out for blood. He is out for revenge. So he couldn't care less what Lenny's situation is. He, uh, he wants, he wants the worst for Lenny. Um, George obviously doesn't want that. Um, he even asks, uh, Slim, couldn't we maybe bring him in and they'll lock him up? Um, but, uh, but again, Curly is out for blood. We also find out the, the end of chapter five that, um, Carlson's Luger, his gun is missing. Um, so that's kind of a big deal, um, that they assume that, uh, Lenny took that gun because, well, you know, that, that would be the reasonable thing to do, especially if you need protection. Um, and so now they're going to be kind of um, on the hunt for him. So let's go ahead and start reading chapter six together. The deep green pool of the Salinas River was still in the late afternoon. Already the sun had left the, the valley to go climbing up the slopes of the Gabalan Mountains, and the hilltops were rosy in the sun. But by the pool among the mottled sycamores, a pleasant shade had fallen. A water snake glided smoothly up the pool, twisting its periscope head from side to side, and it swam the length of the pool and came to the legs of a motionless heron that stood in the shallows. A silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head, and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. I pause for a second, a couple of things. First of all, in chapter six, we do return back to that green pool of the Salinas River, like I was saying, um, and there is kind of an image of peace. Um, and, and tranquility there, which is kind of ironic considering the actual situation is, is very tense, right? We've got men who are after Lenny, um, who are probably hoping to kill Lenny, um, and, and yet we have this backdrop of, of just kind of serenity. Um, but then we have this, um, this image of a, a water snake poking its head up, uh, which reminds me a lot like uh, of Curly's wife, um, who... Uh, who is always looking for Curly. And so in the same way, she kind of pops her head up out of the water, always looking for Curly, always looking for what we know is actually attention. But then also notice that um, a silent head and beak lanced down and plucked it out by the head and the beak swallowed the little snake while its tail waved frantically. I think that's just a, a, um, uh, an echo of what had just happened to Curly's wife, right? Let's keep going. A far rush of wind sounded, and a gust drove through the tops of the trees like a wave. The sycamore leaves turned up their silver sides, the brown dry leaves on the ground scudded a few feet, and row on row of tiny wind waves flowed up the, gr the pool's green surface. As quickly as it had come, the wind died and the clearing was quiet again. The heron stood in the shallows, motionless and waiting. Another little water snake swam up the pool, turning its periscope head from side to side. Suddenly Lenny appeared out of the brush, and he came as silently as a creeping bear moves. The heron pounded the air with its wings, jacked itself clear of the water, and flew off down river. The little snake slid in among the reeds at the pool's side. Lenny came quietly to the pool's edge. He knelt down and drank, barely touching his lips to the water. 
When a little bird skittered over the dry leaves behind him, his head jerked up and he strained toward the sound with his eyes and ears until he saw the bird and then he dropped his head and drank again. When he finished, he sat down on the bank with his side to the pool so that he could watch the trail's entrance. He embraced his knees and laid his chin down on his knees. The light climbed on out of the valley, and as it went, the tops of the mountains seemed to blaze with increasing brightness. Lenny said softly, I didn't forget, you bet. God damn, hide in the brush and wait for George. He pulled his hat down low over his eyes. George gonna give me hell, he said. George gonna wish he was alone and not have me bothering him. He turned his head and looked at the bright mountain tops. I can go right off there and find a cave, he said. And he continued sadly, I never have no catch up. But I won't care. If George don't want me, I'll go away. I'll go away. It's a really quite a, a sad part, but remember at the beginning in chapter one, we learned that um, Lenny really, really wants George's approval, and um, he knows he's done a very, very bad thing. He knows that George is going to be disappointed in him, um, and so I love that he starts practicing his kind of, um, uh, his manipulative routine there of, oh, well, I'll go off and find a cave. And then from out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. She wore thick bullseye glasses, and she wore a huge gingham apron with pockets, and she was starched and clean. She stood in front of Lenny and put her hands on her hips, and she frowned disapprovingly at him. And when she spoke, it was in Lenny's voice. I told you and told you, she said. I told you, mind George, because he's such a nice fellow and good to you. But you don't never take no care. You do bad things. And Lenny answered her, I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. I couldn't help it. You never give a thought to George, she went on in Lenny's voice. He'd been doing nice things for you all the time. When he got a piece of pie, you always got half or more in half. And if they was any ketchup, why, he'd give it all to you. I know, said Lenny miserably. I tried, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I tried and tried. She interrupted him. All the time, he could have had such a good time if it wasn't for you. He would have took his pay and raised hell in a whorehouse, and he could have sat in a pool room and played snooker, but he got to take care of you. Lenny moaned with grief. I know, Aunt Clara, ma'am. I'll go right off in the hills, and I'll find a cave, and I'll live there, so I won't be no more trouble to George. Well, you just say that, she said sharply. You're always saying that, and you know, son of a bitch and well, you ain't never going to do it. You'll just stick around and stew the bejesus out of George all the time. Lenny said, I might just as well go away. George ain't going to let me tend no rabbits now. I'm going to pause real quick. I want to make it clear that Aunt Clara is not really here. Notice when it started this section, it says, um, out of Lenny's head, there came a little fat old woman. Um, so Lenny is imagining this. Um, and the fact that it is coming from his own head is kind of significant because based on what his Aunt Clara is telling him in his head, we find out how Lenny is feeling. And I put that over here on the right-hand side that he feels guilty. He is scolding himself in the voice of his Aunt Clara, right? So it's very, very clear that um, that he knows how much George has done for him, and he feels incredibly guilty because he is literally scolding himself, okay? Um, over here, uh, again, this is something that George had said earlier all the time. I could have had a good time if it wasn't for you, but now Lenny is telling it to himself, and he's really telling himself that he really isn't worth anything, um, that he isn't worth George's time. Let's keep going uh, because the hallucinations are not over. Aunt Clara was gone, and from out of Lenny's head, there came a gigantic rabbit. It sat on its haunches in front of him, and it waggled its ears and crinkled its nose at him. And it spoke in Lenny's voice, too. Tend rabbits, it said scornfully. You crazy bastard, you ain't fit to lick the boots of no rabbit. You'd forget him and let him go hungry, that's what you'd do. And then what would George think? I would not forget, Lenny said loudly. The hell you wouldn't, said the rabbit. You ain't worth a grease jackpin to ram you into hell. Christ knows George done everything he could to jack you out of the sewer, but it don't do no good. If you think George gonna let you tend rabbits, you're even crazier than usual. He ain't. He gonna beat hell out of you with a stick. That's what he's gonna do. Now Lenny retorted belligerently. He ain't neither. George won't do nothing like that. I've knew George since I forgot when, and he ain't never raised his hand to me with a stick. He's nice to me. He ain't gonna be mean. Well, he's sick of you, said the rabbit. He's going to beat the hell out of you and then go away and leave you. He won't, Lenny cried frantically. He won't do nothing like that. I know George. Me and him travels together. 
but the rabbit repeated softly over and over, He gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. He gonna leave you all alone. He gonna leave you, you crazy bastard. Lenny put his hands over his ears. He ain't, I tell ya, he ain't. And he cried, oh, George, George, George. Okay, so once again, I'm not going to explain this too much, but um, the, the rabbit is coming out of his head, this gigantic rabbit. Um, and the things that the rabbit is telling um, Lenny, those are the things that Lenny is telling himself. He's telling himself that he's dumb and incapable and, and worthless, right? He really feels badly this time and that he's, you know, worth leaving. Um, yeah, he's going over his grades for Okay, um, down here. Let's continue on. George came quietly out of the brush and the rabbit scuttled back into Lenny's brain. George said quietly, what the hell are you yelling about? Lenny got up on his knees. You ain't gonna leave me, are you, George? I know you ain't. George came stiffly near and sat down beside him. No. I knowed it, Lenny cried. You ain't that kind. George was silent. Lenny said, George? Yeah. I done another bad thing. It don't make no difference, George said, and he fell silent again. Only the topmost ridges were in the sun now. The shadow in the valley was blue and soft. From the distance came the sound of men shouting to one another. George turned his head and listened to the shouts. Lenny said, George? Yeah. Well, ain't you gonna give me hell? Give you hell? Sure. Like you always done before. Like, if I didn't have you, I'd take my 50 bucks. Jesus Christ, Lenny, you can't remember nothing that happens, but you remember every word I say. Well, ain't you gonna say it? George shook himself. He said woodenly, If I was alone, I could live so easy. His voice was monotonous and had no emphasis. I could get a job and not have no mess, he stopped. Go on, said Lenny, and when the end of the month come... When the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go to a cat house. He stopped again. Lenny looked eagerly at him. Go on, George. Ain't you going to give me no more hell? No, said George. Well, I can go away, said Lenny. I'll go right off in the hills and find a cave if you don't want me. George shook himself again. No, he said. I want you to stay with me here. Lenny said craftily. Tell me like you done before. Tell you what. About the other guys and about us. George said, Guys like us got no family. They make a little steak and then they blow it in. They ain't got nobody in the world that gives a hoot in hell about them. But not us, Lenny cried happily. Tell about us now. George was quiet for a moment. But not us, he said. Because, because I got you and, and I got you. We got each other. That's what that gives a hoot in hell about us, Lenny cried in triumph. The little evening breeze blew over the clearing and the leaves rustled and the wind waves flowed up the green pool. And the shouts of men sounded again, this time much closer than before. George took off his hat. He said shakily, take off your hat, Lenny. The air feels fine. Lenny removed his hat dutifully and laid it on the ground in front of him. The shadow in the valley was bluer and the evening came fast. On the wind, the sound of crashing in the brush came to them. Lenny said, tell how it's going to be. George had been listening to the distant sounds. For a moment, he was businesslike. Look across the river, Lenny, and I'll tell you so you can almost see it. Lenny turned his head and looked off across the pool and up the darkening slopes of the Gabalans. We gonna get a little place, George began. He reached in his side pocket and brought out Carlson's Luger. He snapped off the safety and the hand and gun lay on the ground behind Lenny's back. He looked at the back of Lenny's head at the place where the spine and skull were joined. A man's voice called from up the river and another man answered. Go on, said Lenny. George raised the gun and his hand shook and he dropped his hand to the ground again. Go on, said Lenny. How's it going to be? We going to get a little place. We'll have a cow, said George, and we'll have a pig and chickens and down the flat we'll have a little piece of alfalfa. For the rabbits, Lenny shouted. For the rabbits, George repeated. And I get to tend the rabbits, and you get to tend the rabbits. Lenny giggled with happiness and live off the fat or live on the fat of the land. Yes. Lenny turned his head. No, Lenny, look down there across the river like you can almost see the place. Lenny obeyed him. George looked down at the gun. 
There were crashing footsteps in the brush now. George turned and looked toward them. Go on, George. When are we going to do it? I'm going to do it soon. Me and you. You and me. Everybody going to be nice to you. Ain't, no, ain't going to be no more trouble. Nobody going to hurt nobody nor, nor steal from him. Lenny said, I thought you was mad at me, George. No, said George. No, Lenny, I ain't mad. I never been mad and I ain't now. That's the thing I want you to know. The voices came close now. George raised the gun and listened to the voices. Lenny begged, let's do it now. Let's get that place now. Sure, right now. I gotta. We gotta. And George raised the gun and steadied it, and he brought the muzzle of it close to the back of Lenny's head. The hand shook violently, but his face set and his hand steadied. He pulled the trigger. The crash of the shot rolled up the hills and rolled down again. Lenny jarred and then settled slowly forward to the sand, and he lay without quivering. George shivered and looked at the gun, and then he threw it from him, back up on the bank near the pile of old ashes. The brush seemed filled with the cries and with the sound of running feet. Slim's voice shouted, George, where you at, George? But George sat stiffly on the bank and looked at his right hand that had thrown the gun away. The group burst into the clearing and Curly was ahead. He saw Lenny lying on the sand. Got him by God. He went over and looked down at Lenny, and then he looked back at George. Right in the back of the head, he said softly. Slim came directly to George and sat down beside him, sat very close to him. Never you mind, said Slim. A guy got to sometimes. But Carlson was standing over George. How'd you do it? He asked. I just done it, George said tiredly. Did he have my gun? Yeah, he had your gun. And you got it away from him and you took it and you killed him? Yeah, that's how. George's voice was almost a whisper. He looked steadily at his right hand that had held the gun. Slim twitched George's elbow. Come on, George. Me and you will go in and get a drink. George let himself be helped to his feet. Yeah, a drink. Slim said, you had a, George. I swear you had a. Come on with me. He led George into the entrance of the trail and up toward the highway. Curly and Carlson looked after them, and Carlson said, now what the hell are you supposed to eating them two guys? Okay, so now that we have finished the novel, I would or the novella, um, I would like you to um, answer some questions. And so these are going to require a little bit of thought. I am going to go over the answers after you answer each one, um, but know that I am kind of grading them like a test. Okay, I want to see that you can kind of think through some of these things. All right, so these questions might require a little bit of thought, um, and it might require a little bit of discussion. I'll try and make that clear. Okay. Uh, first question, in chapter 5, Lenny killed his puppy, which foreshadowed him killing Curly's wife. What event foreshadowed the ending or Lenny's death? So what event in the novel, in a lot of ways, is similar to Lenny's death that happened beforehand? I think the most obvious kind of uh, foreshadowing of Lenny's death um, would be when Carlson takes Candy's dog out and shoots the dog. Um, he euthanizes it. Um, and so whether or not George um, was doing this selfishly and killing Lenny selfishly or um, for Lenny's own good is kind of debatable. Um, that's where there's a little bit of ambiguity there. Um, because the truth is Lenny had become a burden upon George. And um, in the same way that Candy Candy's dog was becoming a burden to both Candy and um, and the rest of the guys. Um, Lenny had become quite a big burden on George, and um, so he may or may not have have actually done it kind of selfishly to relieve himself of that. Now, of course, that was difficult. Just like um, you know, Candy letting go of his dog was very very difficult because he lost a friend, right? He lost a companion, and so it was a big deal. Um, but in some ways, I think there was a release or, or a relief. A relief uh, there okay um, on the other side it is possible that um, in the same way that Carlson convinces Candy hey you need to put this dog out of its misery um, I think that Lenny uh, George shooting Lenny could also be kind of him putting in, him out of his misery because if if Curly had caught up to Lenny um, he would not have treated him very nicely in fact it would have been a very very bad situation it would been very very painful for Lenny and so I think in some ways George was um, uh, kind of sparing Lenny of that pain as well. Okay, the second question I'd like you to answer. 
the title of the novella comes from Robert Burns's poem To a Mouse. In it, um, the title of the novel, uh, the line that it comes from, uh, says the best laid schemes of mice and men often go awry. So I'd like you to discuss how does this line fit with uh, fit well within the novel? Okay. Um, Notice that it says the word, or the word discuss. That means you're going to have to put a little bit of thought into this. You're going to have to put a little bit of effort. Um, and, and this might be a longer response than your, your first question. Okay. I think the best way to answer this question has to do with um, the best laid schemes. We can compare those to the dreams of all of the individuals in this book. Not just George and Lenny, because clearly their dream um, is, is no longer a reality, where it says often go awry. Um, so their dream is no longer a reality. But Candy's dream of a retirement that's stable and secure, that one also went awry. Crooks's dream of, of connection and, um, and of belonging and a, you know, a sense of being with, with other people, that dream got shot down by Curly's wife. Curly's wife's dreams of becoming an actress and you know, being loved and admired she never really was loved and admired. And so um, no one's dream really came to fruition in this novel. Everybody's dream got kind of canceled. It went awry. And so I think that's the best way to answer that question, having to do with um, the various characters and how their dreams went awry. The last question I'm going to ask you is, how does this novel fit within the modernist literature movement? Um, to clarify, I'm just asking, like, hey, this is a, a work of, of modernist literature. Of Mice and Men is. It's a little different than Gatsby and what we've seen, um, but how does this novel fit like the qualities of modernist literature? Okay, um, so it definitely maybe you think of your keywords, but or, or think thematically, um, but how does this novel fit within modernist literature? There are a couple ways you can look at this. Remember that um, the, the three key words of modernism, one was disillusionment, the other was rebellion, and the, the last one was hopelessness. And I think disillusionment and hopelessness are good ways um, that this novel fits within modernist, the modernist literature movement. Um, disillusionment, remember, that's when I once thought something was good or possible, and now I don't. I, I now no longer believe in that. Um, and I think uh, with the last question that I asked about the best laid schemes of mice and men go off and awry, that's disillusionment by the end, right? We had so much hope for these people, especially when Candy joined in on the dream and George and Lenny, it, it seemed like their dream was going to be possible. And so you have all this um, excitement for uh, for this dream, and by the end, we know, and this is the other part of it, we know that it becomes hopeless, um, that there really was no progress. Even the fact that the no novella started in the same place that it ended, or it ended in the same place that it started, literally um, in, in physical like setting, um, it, it, was a, it was an endless cycle, right? We ended back exactly where we started. So there was no progress. And I think that's one of the best ways it fits within modernist literature. Okay, so we have finished of Mice and Men. We are not gonna do anything else with it. That was it. That was your last thing. Um, so on Monday, just so you know, uh, and all of next week is going to be, it's going to feel a lot lighter on my end and on your end as well. I'm not gonna have things to do day to day. Um, instead, um, we're gonna just be working on our social justice um, website okay so um, just be aware that's that's all next week I'm um, that's the only thing we're doing next week we're not going to start a new novel or anything like that you're not going to have a day-to-day -day necessarily you know a necessary uh, assignment sorry speaking all today um, but you will uh, I'll give you something on Monday that kind of goes over each page um, and then you're gonna have the entire week to just work on that so um, I hope you guys enjoy your weekend. I know it's kind of weird because this is like not <laughs> really a, a real weekend, weekend anymore, but, um, but do enjoy it and, and keep praying for our, our community, our country, and our world.